Appreciate all the birthday wishes this past week. You guys have one more year with a pastor who's under 50 years old. Enjoy your last year, then we just become another church with an old pastor. But you were so gracious this week. And I, I tell you what's amazing to me is your generosity. The, um, you listen to what I say in my messages and I, it, it kind of floors me because you know I love coffee. I came home talking about Goo Goo Clusters. You wouldn't believe the number of Goo Goo Clusters I got this week for my birthday. So I might be turning 50 next year, but I'm going to turn 500 pounds with it. So, uh, so many things you guys do. And, and somebody in the church uh, just blessed my socks off. I couldn't believe it. There was a present sitting in my Tahoe when I came out of work. Somebody had bought me a cassette player because they heard my message about I have hundreds of old cassettes and I have nothing to play them on. They went and bought me a cassette player that turns them into MP3s. Now I can torture my children in the car with 80s rock and roll. Life is good. They're going to hear Petra, DeGarmo, and Key forever now. It's going to be a wonderful thing. And then I, I said this in the first, I'm just going to say it here because I don't know how else to bring this up. A, a, a couple weeks ago, after Daryl shredded it on his guitar up here, I walked up and I said, you know, someday when I get to heaven, God's going to give me a Fender Stratocaster and the ability to play guitar. Remember when I said that? The very next day I came into my office and there was a Fender Stratocaster sitting there. And I don't know who brought it there and if it's mine. I'm not sure if somebody just left it in my office and I haven't touched it. I've kind of put it off in a corner. I keep asking, Who, whose is this? If you don't correct me pretty soon, I'm going to start thinking God sent a Fender Stratocaster down to me. So if you did leave that for me, there was no card in it or anything. Just let me know so I know what to do with that guitar. Uh, but what a wonderful thing. Man, it's amazing. Um, your generosity is great. It's great to be a pastor of a church who, who has loving people in it. We have a great day planned. We're in James. Those of you who are visiting with us because of the child dedication, the actually family dedication, uh, we're going to have a great time at the end of this service. And uh, we are in a series in the book of James. So if you'd open your Bibles to James chapter 4 this morning or turn on whatever gadget you have to get to James chapter 4, we've been doing this series. It's about authentic faith under pressure. That's why we got this fake egg up here that's cracked. We are living in a world where we are pressed. Uh, we're under pressure all the time. And, and the question is, are we going to live real faith in real life or not? Is this authentic faith or is it just something we do on weekends? Is it real in you? And James cuts to the punch. I mean, James, I mean, there's not a lot of work a pastor has to do to preach through James because I don't have to explain it very much because it's so clear. James just says it and you ought to be able to hear it and go home and say, oh yeah, I, I need, God has to do something in me about this this week. And so it's been fun for me. I hope you've enjoyed it, uh, but it is hard hitting. Last week, we talked through the first part of James chapter four, and we're gonna continue that sermon. It's gonna be actually part two of that message. Can you pray with me? Would you pray as we get ready to preach this morning? I ask that you pray this prayer. You don't have to say anything out loud, but if you just give God this prayer. God, if there's anything you want me to hear this morning, I'm willing to listen. Just give God that prayer. God, if there's anything you want me to hear, I'm willing to listen. God, more than anything, we want you to be glorified. We want the people here to be edified and we want Satan to be horrified. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Authentic faith under pressure. Today we're talking about authentic faith encounters an eye problem. Everybody say eye problem. Everybody bring out your eye gadgets. If you got an eye gadget, bring them out. If it's a Samsung, I'm just, we'll pray for you. But if, if you got an eye gadget, hold them up. We got our eye gadgets. We've got iPods, iPads, we've got iPhones, we've got eye everything. And, and, and I, I do too. This is not a message against technology, but I am finding that we are obsessed with eye. Everybody say eye. Everybody is obsessed with I today. It's all about me. So much so that, uh, do you remember a couple years ago, this, this video gaming came out. You remember, you know what this is called? What's this called? We. We're so obsessed with I, we now spell we with two eyes. Isn't it amazing? We, I mean, it's I everything. And, and uh, again, I'm not against technology. I'm just pointing out that, that we love number one, me. And, and, and what has become the most popular thing in the last 10 years Selfies. We, we like to snap shots of us. We like to snap shots of us with what we're eating and send it out to everybody as if anybody cares what you're eating right now. I mean, we are obsessed with me. 
And it's all of our problem. And as I study this, last week I, I touched on the first half of James 4. Doing more study this week, I realized James isn't done. That's why it has to be part two from last week, because James continues the theme of authentic faith encounters an eye problem. It's about me. Even going back further than chapter four, James talked about the tongue and why we use our tongue to hurt people. Why do we, we hurt people with our words? Well, it's because we're obsessed with me. And when our identity is in, I'm the best, I'm the greatest, if our identity is in that, we must cut everybody down at the knees so that we can be at the top. It's an adult version of King of the Hill. Remember King of the Mountain? Who played King of the Mountain? That's why it was good to be a, what did Sears call it? Hefty? What were you called? Husky. Yeah, I love that word. We always want about the husky genes. It's good sometimes to be the big dude because when you play king on the mountain, everybody gets knocked down so I can be on top. And we do it. We as adults still play king of the mountain. We just do it a little bit more strategically. And we cut people down with our mouths to feel good about self. And that's what James is doing this morning. So I kind of want to use last week's message to launch into this week. But before I do, I just want to point this out. Have you ever heard of the Republic of Melosia? Anybody ever been to Melosia? And some of you are thinking, I see some travelers out there like, I've been to Eastern Germany, Eastern Europe, I've been over, maybe it's over. I'll tell you exactly where Melosia is. Melosia is a country. Melosia is actually closer than you think. Melosia is a country that's found in a little suburb of Las Vegas, Nevada. There's a guy who seceded from the Union and set up his own country in Las Vegas. I'm not making this up. You can go to the webpage for the Republic of Melosia. You will find him. This is Kevin. Kevin is king of Melosia. He has set himself up as the supreme ruler of the land of Melosia. Kevin has gone so far as to set up his own post office. You can visit this, by the way. Next time you're in Las Vegas, go look up the, the nation of Melosia, and you can go there and take a tour. I'm sure he'll collect your money. Which, by the way, Kevin has his own currency, Obviously stole it from a casino, put his own picture on it, but he's got his own currency in the land of Melosia. And not only that, this is new news. This is exciting, everybody. Kevin has recently expanded his kingdom, and he has a, a navy now. <laughs> you think I'm making this all up, but you can, this is all from Kevin's website, the Republic of Melosia King. Isn't that really everybody's secret dream? is if I could be the ruler of my own kingdom, if I could be king over everything. Some of you men think you're, you're king at home, right? But you're not if you don't have the remote. If you don't have the remote, you're not king. It's whoever has control over that TV who's the ruler. But we all want to be a ruler. We all want to be in charge of me, my land. It's all about me. Currency with our own picture on it. This is the epitome of what James picks up and talks about an eye problem. We have an eye problem. And in order to be a follower of Christ, this eye problem must be dealt with because Christ makes it very simple. Jesus said, if anyone were to follow me, if anybody were to come after me, they must deny themselves. Oh, boy, if you want to be king, really hard to deny yourself. If your identity is found in you, it's really hard to deny yourself. That's why Jesus made it simple. If you were to follow me, if you want to call yourself a Christian, then deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and follow me. That's Christ's call for us. It goes totally against an eye problem. So last week, as we were talking through this, we dealt with uh, the first eye problem. It's found, I'll just do verses one and two because we covered these last week. Verses one and two, James chapter four what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. He then goes on to talk about our problem is how we ask and what we ask for. But the first I problem from last week is I am quick to quarrel. Write it down. I'm quick to quarrel. How many of you are quick to spar, whether it be at home or at work? You're quick to battle. You're quick to use the tongue in a negative way. That's being quick to quarrel, and that is a total eye problem. What is the root problem? The root problem of being quick to quarrel is self-centeredness. Self-centeredness. It's all about me. It's all about I. It's all about everybody seeing me as number one and recognizing it's a self-centeredness issue that leads us to being quick to quarrel. 
Second eye problem is found in the next two verses, verse three and four. You ask and don't receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions, you adulterous people. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. The second eye problem James points out is, I have an obsession with possessions. I'm quick to quarrel because of self-centeredness, and I have an obsession with possessions. It's because of self-indulgence. Self-indulgence. Again, you will always serve the God of your life. We are people of worship. Who's the God of your life? If you're sitting on the throne, you will worship yourself, and you will indulge self. It leads us to all sorts of problems. Number one, quick to quarrel. Number two, I have an obsession with possessions. That was last week's message. This week we're moving on and we're gonna cover the, the last part of James chapter four. And it's, the next section is in verse 11 through 12, 11 and 12. James 4, 11 and 12. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Third eye problem in James chapter four is I take joy in judging. I take joy in judging other people. And, and what James is saying here is I speak ill of, or I speak disdainfully of my brothers or sisters. Why do we do that? Again, if, if our identity is in self, if our identity is not firmly rooted in Christ and I am a, a son of the king, if my identity is rooted in me, it's gonna be self-centeredness, self-indulgence, and this root problem is self-righteousness. Self-righteousness. I'll judge other people. We don't speak of the third tongue. It's nothing that our culture is familiar with, but years and years ago, they would speak of a third tongue. Why a third tongue? Well, because every time you speak ill of a brother, sister, or Christ, every time you use the tongue in a negative way about somebody else, anytime you do that, you're killing three people, thus the third tongue. When you speak disdainfully or ill of a brother, you're killing yourself, you're killing the one who hears it, and you're killing the one that message is about. Speaking with the third tongue, we need to be careful that we don't take joy in judging. James does a beautiful thing in this whole talk about joy in judging. He, he then says, if you speak evilly against a brother or judge a brother, you speak evil against the law and judge the law. What is this law? Last week I had some questions typed into me. Uh, when Paul, last week I talked about Paul, he used the word law six times in Romans 7. Six times. And the, the question was, is he speaking about the Ten Commandments? No. Uh, out of those six times, he's only referring to God's law one time. He was using the word law as a general principle or rule. But the one time he was speaking of God's law. But it's not just the Ten Commandments. I think we, we don't understand when Paul, a Jew of all Jews, talks about the law. He wasn't just speaking of the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. We have kind of, in our mind, think that that's all it is. When he spoke of God's law, he was referring to Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. And in that, there's a lot more than just Ten Commandments. The Jewish people loved rules. They should have, you know, should have been a Baptist church. <laughs> they loved rules. And they had lots of rules. Matter of fact, in, in Genesis through Deuteronomy, there's more than 10 commandments. There's over 686 different rules defined. They love their rules. It's all about rules, rules, rules. And, and when Paul is talking about the law, he's speaking of Genesis, Exodus, Vincus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. He's talking about the five books of the Old Testament where all the rules were listed for living. It was a heavy weight. And the law was no good for anything except for to point out that you're a failure at it. <laughs> The Bible says the law is only good to point out your sinfulness. It took Jesus to come to set us free from the law by grace and mercy to forgive us of our shortcomings of the law. But James isn't speaking of that law. I need to explain to you what James is talking about. When James says, you speak ill of a brother or sister in Christ, you're speaking ill of the law. What law was James talking about? Who was James? Little brother of who? Jesus, 
And remember that, that James grew up as the little brother, the half-brother of Jesus. And remember that James did not believe Jesus was the Christ. He didn't believe he was the son of God. He was a sibling. Hard to think of your older brother as God. So he didn't believe it. Something changed everything. How, how would you get to the point where you finally believe that he's, he is the son of God? He is more than just my brother. What changes? Well, Jesus died publicly. He was buried publicly. Three days later, he rose again from the dead. And over 400 witnesses saw him. That changed everything. James went from the little brother of Jesus to a believer and follower of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 1, James 1. He is now a believer in Jesus Christ. So what is James doing? Is James talking about the law, the Ten Commandments, or the Pentateuch? Is he talking about that law? No. James is talking about what his brother said. What did Jesus say was the law? Remember that moment when Jesus was challenged by a lawyer, a Pharisee in the keeping of the law? And that Pharisee came and said, Jesus, tell us, which is the greatest rule? Well, what is the most important law? What is the greatest commandment? The, the, the lawyer was trying to trick Jesus because they had so many laws. And there were so many different branches of, of belief at the time. The lawyer was trying to trap Jesus. No matter what Jesus said, it was going to be wrong, according to somebody. So Jesus didn't even hesitate. What's the greatest law? The greatest law is this. Love the Lord your God is with your heart, soul, mind, body, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. How do you boil that down? Love God. Everybody say love God. Amen. Love people. You can do better than that. I think the first, first service was more awake. Uh-oh. Everybody say love God. Love, God. love, people. love people. That's the center of the mark. Love God, love people. That's what Jesus said. The, the lawyer tried to trick him and, and threw out the question, what's the most important law? Jesus didn't hesitate. He threw out the target. You hunters been going out in the woods? Have you been practicing first? Taking that bow and shooting for the target? You gotta zero it in. Jesus zeroed it in for us. When James is speaking of the law, he's not talking about the Ten Commandments. He's not speaking of the 686 rules that the Jews had to follow. He's talking about Jesus boiled down the law to this great commandment. Love God, love people. Love God with everything you've got. Love people more than you love yourself. That's the law wrapped up in one. So when James says, when you speak ill of a brother... You're judging the law. You're saying, I know what Jesus said, but I'm going to put it below, and I'm above the law. Jesus doesn't take kindly to that. I don't think God would take kindly of that, of you putting your head above his and saying, you know what, I know what you say, but I. And that's the most dangerous words, again, I ever hear, is believers saying, I know what God said, but I. I know what God says in his word would be obedient, but I have a special dispensation. I have a special right because my, and but I, we do a lot of but eyeing. And every time you but I, you put your head above God. You judge the law. Love God, love people. James says, don't do that. Many of you have been at Oakwood, but there's a lot of people that are new. And so those of you who've heard this before, I, I don't apologize. I want the new people to hear it. It's such a great story. My son and I, who's in the front row, Josh, and he gave me permission to do this because I said, you can pick where we go to lunch today. So Josh gets to pick where we go to lunch so I can tell you about Big Dog. We had this great game we called called Big Dog. I learned this because I'm scared to death of dogs. I never liked dogs because dogs don't like me. You can have the nicest dog in the world. If I come to your house, it will bite me. It will. Dogs have a special thing about me. They look through me, they see the evilness, and they're like, I shall kill this man. I don't care. Dogs hate me. And my son is dying for a dog. He's been begging for a dog for months. He wants nothing more in life than a dog. He said, my birthday and Christmas, all I want is a dog. And I'm like, I can't bring a dog into my house. It'll hate me. I'll be a prisoner in my own house. I'm scared of dogs. But I did learn this about dogs. Dogs play big dog. If you put two dogs in an area and they don't know each other, they're eventually going to come together and find out who's the big dog out of the two. How they do this is one dog will put his head above the head of another dog. He'll just rest his head on top. And when a dog rests his head on top of another dog, that dog is saying, I'm the big dog. Here's the problem. It's always the little dog that thinks he's the big dog. If you put two dogs, if you put a, a little chihuahua and a doberman in the same yard, the the, the little chihuahua will come to that Doberman eventually and say, get down here, I'm going to put my head above you. Little chihuahuas think that they're big dogs. 
so they play big dog. And I think this is what James is saying. We judge the law and put our head above God and say, you know what? I know what you said about loving my neighbor more than myself, but I. Josh and I used to play big dog when he was little. He's bigger than me now. It would be really awkward if we still played this game. But when he was a little boy, if Josh came into a room and, and I wanted to play with Josh, I'd just simply ask a question. I'd say, Josh, who's the big dog? And if Josh wanted to play, Josh would look me in the eye. He'd say, I'm the big dog. And then he'd run because he knew what was coming next. Dad was going to pounce on the ground and chase him. And I could catch him quick. He's running with everything he's got. And I'd catch him and take his ankles out. And he'd fall on the ground. And I'd pounce on him. And I would throw his hands above his head. I'd take his shirt and throw it over his head. And then I'd take my mouth right into his bare belly. And I'd go. And I'd say, who's the big dog? And he'd be laughing. He'd be saying, I'm the big dog. And I'd go. And I'd say, who's the big dog? He'd say, I'm the big dog. And I'd hit him again. And then he'd say, I'm going to pee. And then I, <laughs> game was done because he would. Learned that the hard way one time. It just, game's done. But sometimes, sometimes Josh would walk into a room and I'd be like, hey, Josh, who's the big dog? And he'd be like, you're the big dog. So he didn't want to play. I bring that up today because we do that with God. We do that with the creator. The creature looks at what God says about life and how we've got an eye problem. And God says, don't set yourself up above me. Don't judge the law by putting yourself above the law. You're not beyond God's law. We all fall under God's supremacy. Don't set yourself up with an eye problem above a holy God, but submit yourself. Don't think yourself righteous enough to put yourself above a brother or sister. The Bible says love them more than you love yourself. Think of them first. And then James ends with the last eye problem, verses 13 through 17. James 4, 13 through 17. Come now, you who say... Today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him, it is a sin." The fourth eye problem, I plan without praying. I make plans and I leave God out. Is there anything wrong with planning? Please, friends, don't get, don't get me wrong because the Bible is very clear. The whole book of Proverbs is about planning for the future. It's not wrong to have your 401k. It's not wrong to plan for retirement. But if you're doing all of this despite God or not in view of God, then you're doing it wrongly. James makes it very clear that we are boastfully arrogant if we consider our lives the end game. And then he uses that beautiful analogy. Got to use my iPhone to do this. He uses the beautiful analogy of that mist. I've had this up here all morning. And little kids were coming up after we're doing this all, trying to do it too, trying to catch it. It's impossible to catch a hold of and grasp a mist, a vapor. It's here today, gone tomorrow. It's temporary. And James does a beautiful thing by giving a visual and says, what is your life? Your life is but a mist. It's here today, it's gone. Friends, you need to know that when we plan without praying, when we try to live our lives despite God, or as if God doesn't exist, then we're boastfully arrogant, thinking that I'm just going to make plans and do this and this and this next year. I'll go on a business trip and make all sorts of money. Is there anything wrong with going on business trips? Not at all. But ask God to be able to bless your life. Be, be living underneath God's will. Surrender to what his choice is. And if at any point any of your plans go against God's word, then don't do it. Don't do it. If it's wrong, don't do it. It's boastfully arrogant to live life and think, this is what I got, I'll grasp onto it, I got it. No, you don't. It's a mist, it's a vapor, it's here today, it's gone tomorrow. I think James is very generous. He says, you don't even know what tomorrow brings. I think that's generous, because we don't even know what happens today. We don't. None of you can 
can know exactly what the rest of your day is. You don't know. You're, all of us are so fragile. We're one phone call away. That phone ringing could change your life. And I hate being one of those pastors that say, you could die in a car accident on the way. I hate being that pastor. But every once in a while, us pastors need to do a wake-up call and say, you don't know when tragedy might strike. You don't know when this life might end. Matter of fact, I've asked him to put this on the, the screens. It's life. Everybody say life. But in the middle of life, there's two little letters. What do those two little letters spell? If. Your life is an if. It's a mist and a vapor that's here today and gone tomorrow, so what are you living for? God says through James, if you're living without God in view, then you're living in vain. Boastfully arrogant, because you can't know if you have tomorrow. I pray all of you have 80, 90 years even of good years. I pray that, I'm, I'm not praying anybody tragedy, but I want you to know that we're not guaranteed that. Uh, is it what, Psalms 90? I wrote it down when I was reading this week. Psalms 90, let's turn there. I didn't let the first, first service didn't get this. You guys get it. Psalm, Psalm 90. Moses is speaking in Psalms, not all of them written by David. Psalm 90, what did Moses say? Psalm 90, verse 11 and 12, 10 through 12. Psalm 90, 10 through 12. The years of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength, 80, Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. What is Moses saying? Your life is a mist. Even if you live to 70, 80, or 90 even, it's just a mist. And it's just an if. So how are you spending that life? The command here isn't just to do a spiritual word every time you say, where are you going to lunch? We're gonna go down to Red Naps, if God wills. That's not the rule. The rule isn't that you just add a spiritual line every time you make a plan. You know, we're we're going to Escamilla, right? We're We're going to Mexican for lunch, if the Lord wills. Don't just add a spiritual word to it. It's, it's more of an idea and attitude that you understand that our life, life is frail. It can be cut off. This morning we had four families that want to dedicate themselves to raise their children. One of them came to me afterward and said, your message today hit me because I lost my mother two years ago. She got on a plane. I never saw her again. She died. Here today, gone tomorrow. Life is frail. Life is short. Whether it's 40, 50, 60. I've had a terrible experience of doing the funeral for several teenagers. Being a youth pastor for 25 years, I've done suicides, I've done car accidents, I've had terrible, terrible times. There's nothing worse than doing a funeral for a teenager in a town where they just want to know, how did God let this happen? Where is this person? There's so many questions that come up. It'll make your knees knock as a pastor. I've had to stand in front of thousands, fear, in fear of saying the wrong thing and yet wanting to point them to eternity, wanting to point them to Christ. Life is short. We're not guaranteed any breath. Life is frail, life is short, and death is certain. They've done some statistics. You might want to write this down. One out of every one dies. Yeah, don't argue with me on that. It's someone to say, Lazarus, he died again. Death is certain. So, thinking about this, I actually wanted to do a visual. I'll be back. I took, spared no expense in this illustration. Earlier today, I uh, took this line and I boarded it on an airplane, sent that airplane out to California where it was going to be loaded onto a satellite and now it is in space flying. I'm just making that up. Uh, What this is, is for us to pretend today. This is a line uh, of eternity forever. This line is a line of eternity and it goes forever that way. And oh, thank you, Ed, for coming. Appreciate that. Ed's gonna take this and Ed's job is to go out that door where it's gonna board another plane and get on a satellite and head forever in that direction. This line is an eternal line. And for those of you sitting right in the middle, sorry about this, you're gonna have to live with it. This line 
shows eternity. And, and, and the truth is, is that God has always been. We, we talked about that this week in our home. We, we were talking about God has always been. And that's hard to imagine that God had no beginning. Eternity forever. Eternity past. This line never ends. It goes on for eternity. And this line always goes, and we'll go, go out and out the door so they can't see it because they're not going to get the illustration. You've got to leave. Not perfect. This line goes on forever that way. This is eternity. I need you to know today that you're an eternal being. If you're hearing my voice today, you will exist forever. The question is going to be is where? We are eternal beings. Now, we struggle because, I'm going to take just a little bit back. I put this little red section in here. Can you see it? Say yes, PD. This little red section is me. We struggle with eternity because, see, this is where I was born 49 years ago. That's me. I started. And this is me forever. It was hard last night trying to figure out how long to make that line because I don't know where I'm at in this line, really. I know when I was born, so I have a hard time imagining God past forever, never ending. Wow. But I do comprehend from the moment I was born, man, I'm going to live forever, eternity forever. That line goes on forever. It never ends. It never stops. This is in view of reality, but this is what I know. I was born and I will die. And so I'm going to ask you a little bit about this mist, this mist of a life. We're born and we we grow up. Sometimes we struggle with this first part because of the people who raised us. And we, you know, this, this little, it's tough right here. And we struggle a little bit. But then we get jobs and we start working really hard. We work really hard from here to here so we can live this little part here. <laughs> you know, we want to make sure we work really hard here to here so we can have this. And, and man, if this is your whole life, if this is it, if this is all we're here talking about today, I feel sorry for you. We're so caught up in here to here and we'll waste all of this because our minds only see this and we don't have eternity in view. And this is what James is teaching. James is saying, what is your life? Your life is but a mist. Here today, gone tomorrow. So what do we do? Is it wrong to plan? No, it's not wrong to plan, but don't plan without God involved. Don't plan without thinking about all this money-making part is not just so I can live this little part happy here. This, leave a legacy. What is the problem? Sorry if this hit you. Sorry, I had to let it go. What is the problem? It's self-sufficiency. Self-sufficiency. I live without God in view. And, and that's wrong. Life is short. It's not wrong to plan, but plan with eternity in mind. Leave a legacy. It's not all about you. There's been a lot happening before you, and there's a lot that's going to happen when you're gone. What are you doing with this mist that God does let us have? He graciously allows us every breath. So what are we doing with that breath? Are we making an impact for his kingdom? Are we making a difference that will last longer than our mist? I challenge each and every one of you to be thinking about eternity when you make decisions about your immediate future. <laughs> I'll wrap it up with this little chart uh, in the back of your material there. Uh, you can fill this out if you'd like to. I'd, I'd like us to take a look at this. This is simply the, the, the words we've used today in, in kind of a pie chart. It's self-centeredness, which leads me to be quick to quarrel. It's self-indulgence that leads me to have an obsession with possessions. It's self-sufficiency that leads me to plan without praying. It's self-righteousness that gives me joy in judging my brothers and sisters. All this is an I problem. Everybody say I problem. So we need to head toward the middle of the target. What needs to, what needs to happen? Well, if we're quick to quarrel, God desires for us to have peace. Everybody say peace. This week, I would challenge you, you don't have to do it this morning, but I challenge you this week to, to get to the center of that target and start writing specific for you. What is it gonna take for me to live at peace in my home or peace at work or peace with my relatives? What, was it gonna, what is it gonna, the Bible says, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with every man. So what does God need to do in your heart to keep you from self-centeredness and lead you to peace? Generosity. What do I need to be giving in order to, to keep me from self-indulgence and the obsessions with possessions? What do I need to be giving? And please don't think money only. I'm not preaching about cash. I'm preaching about everything in your life, your time, your talent, your treasure, your testimony, all of it. What are you leaving a legacy behind with? What about 
self-righteousness, my joy in judging. You, you need to pray that God gives you humility. So what, what can you write down in the target that would help you hit that target of humility? And then lastly, submission the self-sufficiency that leads me to plan without praying, to think that this little short span of life is all there is. What, what needs to change there for me to be submitted to God? Are you submitted to a God? God, the holy God, a creator of all things. Are you submitted to him? We're not talking about salvation here. If you're here this morning and you've never accepted God's wonderful gift of salvation, I urge you, simply go to God and, and you can pray a prayer you don't have to be, there's no special words, there's no magic prayer, but I remember being a young man and I remember saying, God, I know I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sin and come into my life as my Savior and Lord. That simple prayer, God honors that. And if you wanna be saved this morning, you need to humble yourself and say, I know I'm a sinner. God, forgive me of my sin and come into my life. Then you receive salvation, amen? Everybody say amen. And I pray that that's happened in your life, but I'm talking about the next step. The next step has to be submission. So you can pray for salvation, only concerned about not having to pay for the penalty of your sin. A lot of people pray a prayer because they don't want to pay for the penalty of their sin, but they still want to enjoy their sin. And so if you're saved this morning, praise God for that. But my next question is, are you submitted to God? I'm saved and I am submitted to God as my Lord and my King. Has that happened in your life? Have you surrendered to him? If not, then you're gonna struggle with this eye problem. And I challenge you, if you haven't received God's salvation, by his grace, ask him to save you today. If you are saved, have you surrendered? Are you still struggling with this eye problem in any one or all four of these categories? I think this is it. I have a new appreciation for James chapter four. I think if you make an appointment to come into my office this week and you want to say, Pastor, I'm really struggling at home with my children, I'm going to say, let's look at James chapter 4. I think if you're struggling in your marriage this week and you say, Pastor, can we come and talk? We're struggling in our marriage. I'm saying, let's open up James chapter 4. I really think we can do a lot of good if we just look through James chapter 4 and realize that James is talking about his brother's teaching, Jesus' is teaching about humility and sacrifice and surrender. And I think if we would just get into James 4, We'd solve a lot of these issues that are in our lives because it boils down to these. It comes down to this one word. I've been using this. I ought to write the book, I think, because I think, I think what I'm picking up on in Scripture from beginning to end as we do the Gospel Project. We started in Genesis, and I see the turmoil in the world and all the problems with sin. I'm recognizing that it boils down to the center of this target has got to be self-control. I hate the word self in there because you might think that you have some ability to do this. You don't. You have to surrender to Christ and ask him to give you this God sense of self-control in your life. But I think it boils down to this. We need to learn to control our own desires. Is there anything wrong with planning? No, but we twist it and get it wrong. Is there, any, is there anything wrong with celebration? We as Christians ought to be the most celebratory people in the world. And yet we could turn celebration into addiction right away, can't we? Celebration can be something that really ruins your life if, if you twist it. So I challenge each and every one of us to consider this. James chapter four gets to the heart of the matter and the heart of the matter is your eye. Are you struggling with an eye problem today? Tracy, would you come? As Tracy comes with the band, I, I'm reminded of the song they sang. Um, so help me with it, Tracy. I always get it wrong. Oh, yes. Yeah, well, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. And then the verse says, the cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back, no turning back. And then we flip that song. We flipped it. The world before me, it's all for me. I got the cross at my back. The cross is at my back. We flipped it. I like the way the songwriter wrote it. It's the cross before me, the world's behind me. There's no turning back. No turning back. My life is a mist. I don't have time to invest in these short years that I'm here. I don't have time for that. I'll make plans. I'll take care of my family. I want to make sure I honor that. But God, help me, help me to invest in the future. Help me invest in the rest of eternity. 
Let's pray that God convicts our hearts of this. Father God, in the name of Jesus, may you take our lives, may you shake our hearts up and our minds awake today and think about what are we doing? What are we living for? And if we're followers of Jesus, help us to give it all. Help us not to hold anything back, but to surrender to you, I pray in Jesus' name. Stand with us as we sing.
Thank you, team. You may have a seat for a moment. We uh, enjoy um, doing family dedications. I'm going to ask the House family and the Ross family to join me here. Uh, we we uh, added the Ross family here at the last moment, and, and we're excited to have them here with us to do this this morning. Had four families. You can stand over here with Eleanor. And we've got two here. We've got Ivy and Aria. Uh, well, my son just went through a terrible spot of poison ivy, so yours is not poisonous, is it? Okay, good, okay, good. Uh, we've got Ivy and Avery and uh, Eleanor here with us this morning. I want to set some theology because this is important that we know what we're doing here. Uh, last night I, I sent out a little message telling what they were going to do, and there was even a question on that. is like, well, wait, what are you asking us to do, Pastor? Uh, I'm not asking you as a church to make a vow to raise their children. God has given them the responsibility to raise their children. We as a church have some responsibility because we're their brothers and sisters, Amen. And so I'm going to call us to pray and, and uh, take any part we can into backing these parents up. But I want to set the theology straight because maybe you're here from another background and, and you're used to christening or a, a baby baptism or baby dedication. I'm really picky about words here because I let Scripture guide us and I, I read Scripture and, and nowhere in Scripture does it ever say that a baby uh, can be saved, that, a, that an infant can be somehow taken care of spiritually by their parents. I, I read in Scripture that God has no grandchildren. So they can't be like opted in through moms and dads. But I do see that every parent bears a responsibility. That's why we don't do a baby baptism or a baby dedication. We do a family dedication. Because what's happening here this morning is we want to, these families desire to dedicate themselves to something. I wrote down four thoughts. What we're doing here is for these parents, it's a confirmation of their supreme love of Christ. This is a confirmation of their love for Christ. They want their children to grow up to have a love of Christ. They want to give these children every opportunity to know Christ for themselves and to be a developing disciple. This is a clarification of the ownership of this child. These parents want to give their children to God who is owner of them. We see that in Scripture that, that parents would take their children to the, to the temple. Even Mary and Joseph took Jesus to the temple as a declaration of ownership. And then there's a commitment to raise that child under the lordship of Christ. These parents are committing themselves to raising their children in this way. And then finally, it's a, it's a claiming of God's best plan for the children. We're doing that today. We know God wants the best for these families and these children. And so we're, we're not dedicating children, but the families are dedicating themselves to this wonderful task. And in a sense, I'm asking you to take it very seriously. As a church, we have a child care system, and we have a sunshine park, and then we have a soul fire ministry and roots ministry, and on it goes. At every age group, we want to offer families that will back them up. It, it, they're standing here today saying, we want to do our best. Well, we're going to, as a church, say we want to do our best too. That's what it's simply about. So I'll start with Eleanor. This is David and Dana House. Can I hold Eleanor? Hi, Eleanor. Oh. Oh, what? No, don't have her, don't have her, don't have her. Oh, got her. She's like, I know, I'm not giving her to you till you got the babe. Oh, it is. It's better than a new car smell. Oh, babies are so cute. One thing I love about, and you don't want to see me. Look at Eleanor. One, one thing I like, they say never turn your back on the audience. This is the one time. One thing I like about Oakwood is after church, I love to go out into the hallway and see all the babies. And I always say, I love babies. And I love that this church shows signs of life. And if you're ever at a church and, and there's no children, there's no young people and everybody's got gray hair, all of a sudden you start going, where's life? This is a wonderful blessing of God that he gives us families with young children. And I take it seriously. What a responsibility. I'll give Eleanor back. David, I want to take it. You ever? All right. All right, which one's Ivy? Which one's Avery? Ivy, can I hold Ivy? Can I, will, you, will you come to me or are you going to be scared of me? How about I just stand next to you? Because I can tell when the child looks at me and says, Mom says, stay away from strangers. Ah, uh, sweetheart. And then this is Aria. Can I hold Aria? Aria. Oh, this is my favorite Sunday. Hi, what you got? You got a toy? She's a sweetie. Don't look to him. He won't help you. What a blessing we have to have families with children. Pastor uh, Shane, can you come? Will you, are you able to, or am I untying you from something? I just want to end our service today with prayer. 
and I ask Pastor, one of our other elders here to come and, and we'll lay hands on, I'll let you lay hands on uh, Eleanor. I've got Ivy and Aria. Ah, oh, good. Let's just pray. Father God, I pray a blessing today on these families. God, I'm so thankful for families. I'm thankful for their desire to have their children know you. God, we pray that there'll come a time and God, it'd be great if it was at home or if it's here, God, help us to be up to the task as a church in the child care in Awana or Sunshine Park. God, help us to be ready to bless these children with your word. And God, I pray that they'll come to know you. I pray that they'll uh, grow as developing disciples here at Oakwood. And, and God, that maybe one of these days we'll be sending one of them out to serve you in a special way. God, all these things we just commit to you. We don't know. Life is an if. So we just ask you and we commit today uh, to being all that we need to be as a church and as these families need to be everything that you've called them to be. We pray that in Jesus' name. I forgot to ask, but does Eleanor have any family here today? Any f- extended family? Stand, please. And how about Aria and Ivy, if your family is any from the Ross side? Yep, stand. Oh, it's beautiful. I'm going to give back to you. Yes, God bless you. And thank you for being here with us today for that. We do have something. I'll give you the empty one. We, uh, we do this, we found this last year, and so we, we did this for some families, and we're going to give this to you uh, today. You're going to get two of these, and uh, we've got one for the houses. What this is is a jar of 936 pennies, and what it is is there's 936 weeks that these parents have before these children are 18, and so it's symbolic of every week of this child's life under the control of their parents and in their homes. And so what I'm going to do is, is challenge you as parents to take the jar of pennies, put it at home somewhere, and every Sunday when you come home from church, you simply take one of the pennies out and you put it in this jar as a, as a symbol of investing. You're investing in these children, but you need to know that time is short, and so there's a time involved. You're going to have to go home and take out lots of pennies for this one already, and, and you're going to know moms hate that because moms are going to be like, whoa, I've lost this many weeks. But really, it's not about losing. It's simply about the importance of investing every day, every week. We want it to be a symbol for you. So we'll make sure that each of these families have these jars and they can use that as a symbol of, of God's uh, time frame. He's given parents to invest in these children. Amen? Stand with a, a closing blessing. And as you stand, two things today. Uh, the ladies are out in the hallway for their ladies' Christmas brunch, and you need to sign up for that. There's specific tables and things like that. I don't know all the details, but you need to stop at the table, ladies. It's a great uh, opportunity for all women of Oakwood. Stop and ask them any questions you might have. Secondly, this is a big ask, but we're planning our Christmas series. Uh, December, uh, the three weeks in December, uh, we're going to have a series t- called More more. And we're going to talk about what Christ gives us as opposed to what the world gives us uh, when it comes to Christmas. But in doing so, we need help. If you're artistic and like stage decor, if you like making the big presentation, um, come meet us here at the end of the service and talk to us as a team so we can maybe use some of your giftedness in getting this prepared for our Christmas series. That's just an offer for you, okay? Let's just pray. Father God, we pray a blessing on all who are here today, a blessing on these families, their extended families. God, help us to go today realizing life is short. It's precious. Help us to use it wisely and correctly according to your word. God bless these children. Bless each and every one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Go in peace.